أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وآله وصحبته أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I plan to regularly and I need to set a schedule for this that's better uh, to come uh, live to Instagram as well as on my YouTube page and read through some important texts that are meant to foster um, a higher level of thought and studies, and more importantly, to help those interested in religious studies in a formal way map out the process, how you push into learning. So before we get started, I want just people to know, like, this may not be for everybody, um, but this is for people who are interested in religious studies and then people who need religious studies but at the same time it will serve everyone because there's so many content provider providers out there and just because someone may have access to share content doesn't mean that they're necessarily qualified so what what we're going to do is read a very important text called anuqaya of imam asiyuti imam asiyuti dies 9 11 after hijri he's an incredible scholar mashallah he did a tremendous effort and work for uh, the ummah in so many different fields of studies. And as we get started, it's very important that we remember uh, brothers and sisters in Morocco, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us be in a position to help and assist them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept those who passed away and to bring peace and mercy and joy um, in the hereafter to them, and also to bring a sense of security and relief to their family members. So we're going to be reading this text, and this text is going to number one, show you the measure needed for someone to be like officially speaking about Islam. What are the qualifications that someone should have before they, for example, are teaching Islamic studies or talking about Islam? There has to be some sense of accountability and regulation structures. The number two is going to introduce you to a classical text, which is really awesome, alhamdulillah. And number three, for those of you interested in seriously pr pursuing religious studies, is going to provide you a map. And this syllabus that I'm going to share with you through this book is what actually we teach at our school, uh, Swiss. So the word anuqaya, actually it's an adjective talking about a noun which isn't mentioned. A al kurasa anuqaya, which means as Imam Suyuti, he also explained this book. This is his explanation of the actual text. The actual text is very short. Uh, Imam Suyuti says that I... I placed in this refined light notebook. So a nuqaya means something refined, something pure. These ideas that he's going to share with us. And in this text, he's going to go through 14 subjects that somebody should learn about in order to then measure their growth in their religious studies. Because oftentimes I've been there when I embraced Islam, it's like, what do I need to study? Where do I go to study? What are the subjects I should look for? What are the things that I should give importance to? So this text, he's going to go through 14 subjects that a budding religious educator should cover and know. I also believe that these kind of things should formulate our job interviews with potential imams and Islamic studies teachers. We should be able to evaluate and make sure that they're qualified to do what they're doing. The same thing for those of you who don't have that interest, but you, you're taking in content from people online. You can use this to measure where people are. Like, are they qualified to be discussing and talking about Islam? My, my approach in explaining this is what we call the dirasa and nasiya. A dirasa and nasiya means that we're going to go through it word by word. So it's not for everybody, but it is specifically for chaplains, for example, people that are in, say, Bayan, Claremont School, people that are in Medina and Azhar, who speak English, people in Dara Ulums, people who are in, entertaining the idea of becoming religious educators. Homeschoolers can use what we're about to talk about. Uh, young people that are interested in just like studying Islam, but not necessarily at a professional level you should be conversant in each of the subjects. What's interesting is Imam Asiyuti talks about 14 sciences, and one of them he talks about is medicine. So he actually mentions that studying medicine is one of the 14 sciences or disciplines that a, a religious teacher should know. Why? Like, why would he have a section on al-tib? 
he has a section on on, on, on on anatomy. Like, why would it be important for any imam or sheikh or mufti or religious educator to be familiar with medicine, to be familiar with human anatomy? And he actually locates this as being religious subjects. Because every day, almost, I receive a question about something that is intersecting between religion and medicine, religion and science. So he mentions mathematics. He goes through mathematics because how are you going to help people with their inheritance or their zakah if you're not familiar with, say, math? So here you can appreciate Imam Asiyuti, rahimahullah, not only mentions Quran, Sunnah, da 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 da, right? Those things are important, but he expands the depth and flexibility of religious scholarship so that it is equipped to deal with the challenges of any age and locates things like good handwriting, right? Good composition, medicine, mathematics, human anatomy. Why? Because those are things that scholars will need to know in order to function. One of the things that you also will appreciate about just listening to this is we are sometimes told that Islam is regressive and that we are also told by some Muslims that Islam is in opposition to the current age we live in. So we have these two kind of absolutist mentalities. One, especially held by people more on the left-leaning side of things, is that Islam is re regressive, it's keeping us from progress. The other on the more conservative-leaning side are that Islam is inflexible and, and sits as a dam in front of the modern age. Both of these are problematic because both of them are going to polarize Islamic thought in a way that's going to drain from it the nuance and temperament and flexibility to function in the world. So Islam has always been about sifting and filtering society. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't completely reject the people of Mecca, nor does he completely accept them, but he's able to engage them in, for example, usul al fiqh we have istishab, it's just have means something that has no ruling. If it's deemed good by Islam coming outside of the text, meaning coming from society, it maintains that goodness from the word Sahaba. It's just have it, it, it's, it's goodness companions, it, if you will, all the way through time. So what I think another important reason for reading a text like this with you is to see the beauty, flexibility, capability, and strength of Islam to take on all ages and all situations. Islam not only functions as a sandbag against immorality and uh, uh, disbelief, nor, nor does it function as something that completely capitulates to an era. But Islam is so profound and so deep and so beautiful that it can, in a very flexible way, in a firm way, guide us through any situation. And the reason for that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the rub of Islam. Allah created all times and all situations. And he made the Prophet the final messenger. And he made the Quran the final book, alayhi salam. So therefore, it will be able to function in any given situation. If Sayyidina Yunus, alayhi salam, can worship Allah in the belly of a fish, you and I, we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever we are. So Imam al Siyuti in this book, uh, al Nuqayah, is going to map 14 subjects that we need to study. And we're going to go through one subject every week, inshallah, or two, until we finish the text. And then you will have the roadmap for what you need to study if you're interested in being a student of knowledge and also how to evaluate religious con content providers and teachers to make sure that it's not just a brand that carries a risala. We are Carrying, we are carrying the risala that may lead to a brand. It's very different than what we find in social media today. So he begins, he says, Matan al nuqaya The word matan means a small text. I like to tell people matan gives you the meat because the word matan, of course, M U T T O N, is meat, right? But matan in Arabic means a small text. So if someone wants to get to the meat of Islamic studies, let them have their matan. See how I. I did that, subhanAllah. <laughs> it's a double entendre. He says, Bismillah rahman rahim He begins, Bismillah rahman rahim because, of course, the Qur'an begins that way. 
And the Prophet وسلم, said, everything which is super important, you should begin it with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, or it will not have a complete blessing. فَهُوَ أَقْطَعْ وَأَبْتَرْ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Alhamdulillahi wa shukru lahu. Qala al-Imam al-Siyuti rahimahullah. All praise is due to Allah and thanks is to Allah. Alhamd is different than shukr. Alhamd is coming from our understanding of something's greatness. Shukr is said in in, our, in, in opposition, in the context of us understanding something's goodness to us. So when someone does something good, we say shukran. We don't say alhamdulillah. But when we see something awesome or something amazing, we say alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah comes from knowing Allah. The shukr of Allah comes from recognizing Allah's blessings. And the complete person is the one who brings them both together. Alhamd wa shukr. So Sayyidina Siyuti says, Alhamdulillahi wa shukru lahu. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khayri nabiyyin arsalahu. And may the peace and blessings be upon the best prophet. There's two ways to say nabiyyin or nabiyyin. Arsalahu ay arsalahu Allahu ta'ala. And peace and blessings upon the best prophet that Allah sent. The word khayr, it does not have a form af'al. So you don't say ah yar, you say khair. Khair means afa, so the best. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadihi nuqaya. This kirasatun nuqayatun. These pure pages, min iddati ulum, contain are from some of the disciplines. Yahtaju al-taribu ilayha, ila ma'rifatiha. That every student needs to know. When we use the word ma'rifah, it's different than ilm. The word ma'rifah is different than ilm. Ma'rifah is used in the beginning of our studies. Ilm is used at the end of our studies. So ma'rifah, ya Sayyid Hassan wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Ma'rifah deals with a tasawwur, conceptualization. We say in Islamic logic, ma'rifah bi ma'na idrak al-mufrad to conceptualize something and ilm is dealing with nisbah relationships idrak and nisbah you need to pay attention to this if you're serious about your studies so salams to Howard MSA had a great time there Friday may Allah bless you such a beautiful community mashallah in DC so idrak al-mufrad means learning conceptualizing something Idrak and nisbah means to conceptualize relationships. We say that conceptualization is ma'rifa. Affirmation or denial is ilm. Remember this. Conceptualization is called ma'rifa. The, the affirmation of that idea or denial is called ilm. So in Islamic logic, we say ma'rifa idrak al-mufrad. Ilm idrak al nisbah. Ma'rifa is conceptualizing something. Ilm knowledge is to affirm or deny a relationship. I'll give you an example. If you move to a, a, a new college campus or a neighborhood for the first time, you before you can navigate that campus or that neighborhood, you have to conceptualize it. So you may ask, where is the cafeteria? Where is the halal restaurant? Where is the MSA at? Where is the musalla at? And people tell you here, here, here. So you begin to envision it in your mind. Then you go to the location and you know what? You find out, subhanAllah, there's no restaurant here. That's ilm. Now that's idrak and nisbah. Now you're, you're able to affirm or deny what you conceptualized. You see, this is something in Islamic studies that's very important. Very important. So idrak al-mufrad, idrak al nisbah Idrak, ma'rifa, al-ilm. Ma'rifa, oh really, there's a halal restaurant over there? Then I go there, it's not there. That's ilm. Tagdib. Tagdib al I'm denying that proposition. If I go there and there is a halal restaurant, that's also an ilm. Now, tasdiq. Tasdiq wujudu. And I want you all to listen to something. Think about this. 
in the current epic that you live in, and this may shock you, in the current time you and I live in, our entire thoughts, the, the focal point of all of our ideas is around the economy. Everything. But if you think about what I just told you, that Islam is worried about ma'rifa and ilm, conceptualizing something and then affirming its existence or non-existence. The focal point of Islamic life, as the focal point in the West and the world now is the economy, the focal point, the qibla of our lives as Muslims is existence, non-existence, existence, non-existence, existence, non-existence. Because if we follow that and we allow that to drive our being as the economy drives our being now under capitalism or communism, that practice of it exists, doesn't exist, exists, doesn't exist, will lead us to ihsan. To worship Allah as though you see him, even though you can't see him, you know he sees you. So the pedagogy of the classic Islamic system is set up in a way that trains the person to compass their entire being, emotions, acts, thoughts, anxieties, and joys on existence, not existence. And the conclusion is the only thing that exists with no beginning and no ending is Allah. So therefore, what should drive me is my conviction in Allah's wujud. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I just told you actually is very important. And pay attention to it. What drives the postmodern psyche, the ethos that rests in the minds of people is money. What drives the Muslim is existence, non-existence. Idraq al-mufrad, idraq al-nisbah. That's why Allah subhanahu wa says, وَمَا خَلَقُوتُ الْجِنَّ وَإِنْسَا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create human beings and jinn except to worship me. Ibn Abbas said, أَيْ إِلَّا لِيَعْرِفُونَ Except to know me. And that's why the first obligation in Islam is to know. أَوَلُ مَا يَجِبُوا عَلَى مَنْ كُلِّ فَأَمُنْكِنًا مِنْ نَذْرِي أَنْ يَعْرِفَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَ بِصِفَاتِ بِمَا عَلَيْهِ نَصَبَ الْآيَاتِ As Imam Ibn Asher mentions in this famous poem, the Andalusian scholar, he said that the first obligation on a person is to think. Think about what? Conceptualize, accept, deny. Conceptualize, accept, deny. So the Muslim is someone who's trained to allow what moves them emotionally and allows them to set their moral compass and priorities on what exists permanently, what exists that helps me achieve the hereafter, and what doesn't exist, or what's temporary. And then I create my priorities on that. That's why the outcome of properly studying theology is zuhd. To be in a healthy detachment from the corruptive uh, corrosive ingredients of the temporary world. Subhanallah. So Sayyidina Imam Al-Suyuti says, مِنْ عِدَّةِ عُلُومٍ يَحْتَاجُ أَطَارِبُ إِلَيْهَا إِلَى مَعْرِفَتِهَا So the purpose of this book here is to give us a basic conceptualization of the Islamic, normative Islamic curriculum. What should I be learning? What should I be studying? If I want to deeply engage in the pedagogy of Islam. And I worry about this generation because what I see now is talk shows after talk shows after talk shows. Muslims are more busy talking about people than they are talking about Allah. Muslims are more engaged in talking about dunya than talking about akhirah. Muslims are more engaged in talking about the beauty of this life than the akhirah and worship. That's scary, man. That is scary. So he says, uh, And every religious science is going to rest on one of these 14 topics that Imam Asiyuti is going to talk about in this text. Wallaha, and this wow is called wa al-mathu'ul. Wallaha, meaning 
I ask Allah. Wallaha alone, as'alu, I ask. And yanfa'a biha, to make this text a benefit, he says, wa yusila asbab al khayri bi sababiha, and that this book will be a cause of goodness. So we'll begin now the first section, the first science. Imam Sayyidina Asiyuti is going to mention 14. 14 sciences. We're going to go through the first. And for those of you who are joining now, we're going to be reading from time to time a text that goes over the 14 subjects. Anyone who's interested in being a student of knowledge should cover. Anyone who is a content provider, whether on TikTok or Instagram, should be judged by their knowledge of these 14 sciences. If they don't have it, then there are certain things they shouldn't talk about. SubhanAllah. They should be careful. And the first one he says, Usul al-Din. Usul is the plural of us. Usul is called Jam'u Taksir. Like Fuhul. Fahal, Fuhul. Fuhul means people. So Asul, Usul. So when we see this Jam'u Taksir, why is it called Jam'u Taksir? Because the plural is broken. Between the wow and the lamb, there's a break. Usul Tafsir. Faqara Usul Ad-Din. What does he mean by Usul Ad-Din? The foundations of the Deen. The most of Sunnis, when they say Usul Din, they mean three things. Number one, Ilahiyat, studying God. Number two, Anubuwat, prophethood. Number three, Asamiyat, Awal Ghaibiyat, the unseen. So when we hear the word Usul Ad Din, the majority of Sunnis mean these three areas Ilahiyat or Tawheed, Godhood, Anubuwat, prophethood. Number three, as-sam'iyat. As-sam'iyat means those things that are heard. It's very beautiful. Why would the scholars use the word sam'iyat? Because as-sam, I have to listen. So this runs against the notions of transmodernity, that what I feel is the truth, what I infer is the truth, it's all about me. No, no. It's not his Islam. It's not how I perceive Islam to be. I have to learn what Islam is. I have to hear it. From the Quran or from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's what the Sahaba, radhiallahu anhu, what did they say? Sami'na wa ata'na. We hear, we intake. Not dreams, not feelings, not experiences, not this. La, I have to learn. So now the Sheikh Imam Asiyuti is going to introduce the first subject out of fourteen subjects that we should study. We should learn. If you're new to Islam. You want to use this map to guide yourself, man. What are the things you should study to learn if you're interested? Because I know for me, when I embraced Islam, I wanted to learn first to worship correctly and second to preserve Islam amongst my family, generational spirituality. The person that's caught up in the current monoculture of the economy is always worried about generational wealth. But the Muslim, the mu'min, who's able to parse his or her engagement with this current time is not only thinking about that, but most importantly, is thinking about generational spirituality. How am I going to make sure my, my offspring follow the deen? So he says, Usul al-Din. He begins with Usul al-Din. We said Usul al-Din, Imam Siyuti, means three things. Godhood, prophets, and the hereafter, the unseen. Maybe somebody says, why doesn't he call it Tawheed? Why doesn't he call it Aqidah? We have a very important principle. You want to remember this. You want to write this down. And that principle says, "La mushahata fi istilah." We don't argue over terms. This is a classic principle of Islamic, the ac Islamic academic tradition. We don't argue over terms because what do terms mean? You can call it food. You can call it bread. You can call it a staple. Still food. So Islamic scholars were very invested in removing us from childhood shallow reductive arguments and one of the things that they would do is say don't argue about what you call something we see this all the time someone embraces islam we say mashallah welcome this convert brother and immediately someone starts to make it revert convert revert convert revert convert and what's lost in all this debate is the person who embraced islam also i don't like the word revert or convert because you should just call them new muslims because when you say new Muslim, that implies an eventual commitment to pushing into the community and being part of the community, not an external terminology that separates them from the larger body of the community, 
new Muslim because after 20 years you can't be a new Muslim. But Imam al Siyuti is going to begin now with Usul al-Din. He says, Ilmun, a science, yubahathu, which researches, fihi, which researches, amma yajibu i'tiqaduhu, what we have to believe. So now he introduces Usul al-Din as the first out of 14 subjects we should learn well. And this is the subject of faith, what we have to believe in as Muslims and what we have to deny. He says, and the first one, he says, Rahimuhullah, Al-Alamu Hadith, the first thing we believe in and that we should discuss in theology is that the world is temporary. That all creation is temporary, Hadith. From Hadith to talk, because hopefully our, our talking isn't too long. It should have a beginning and an ending. The word Hadith, that's what we call an accident, an accident. Haditha. Haditha. So Imam Asiyuti, he begins, and this is where most of the scholars of the Asha'ira and Maturidiyah begin their introductions to Aqidah. That's why Imam Al-Razi in his books back there, Khamsun fi Usul al-Din, Arba'un fi Usul al-Din, always the first section is that the world and everything except Allah is temporary. Again, what motivates and drives us is not the economy. What motivates us and drives us is existence. And Allah is the only true existence, meaning no beginning, no end. So therefore, what should drive me and motivate me is pleasing Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-alamu hadithun. The word hadith means it has a beginning and an ending. That's why Imam Sheikh Dardir, he says in Al-Kharida, which we teach at my school at Swiss, he says, Huduthuhu wujuduhu ba'd al-adam. That the huduth of something is that it did not exist and now it exists. That means you and I are hadith. You and I are not permanent. Every mountain will be turned to rubble eventually. No matter how great we may think we are, no matter how many accomplishments we have, we only are here temporarily. That's called hadith. And when I realize I'm hadith, that I'm here temporarily, the outcome of that is feeling impoverished to the one who isn't hadith, to the one that has no beginning and has no ending. And what we know from the laws of thermodynamics is that all matter, all creation is temporary. And that matter cannot create nor destroy itself. Yet matter is here. So whatever made matter is not matter, and therefore, since matter has a beginning and an ending, whatever made matter does not have a beginning or ending. Someone's asking, Hal anta Muslim? Hal ana Muslim? Are you Muslim? Do you honestly think a kafir is going to be teaching the book Al Nuqaya of Imam al Siyuti? Hal tattaqid ya akhil habib? Anna man la yu'min billah yudarrish wa yashrah kitab al Siyuti al Nuqaya? Yeah, Maulana. Very interesting in the racial dynamics in the community. So whatever has no beginning and no ending is not matter. And we know that all matter has a beginning and an ending. But it didn't start itself. It can't end itself. That's why it's hadith. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not hadith. He's the creator of all things. That also extends to a second discussion. Why we say that Jesus isn't God? Because Jesus alayhi salatu salam was matter. He walked on the earth. He was subjected to physical laws. He ate, he drank, he got tired. He was subjected to the laws of gravity. And he had a beginning and an ending. And he evolved. And we say that endings and beginnings are macro and micro. The macro is we were born. The micro is we continue to exchange throughout our life. We continue to change every wrinkle on your face is a reminder of taghayyur, changing. So one of the most important arguments we have with everyone, atheists, Christians, whoever, Hindus, is the idea of al-huduth. Why would you worship something which is temporary? Why would you worship something that cannot create itself nor destroy itself? And we know that matter cannot create nor destroy itself. So therefore, whatever created and will destroy matter is not matter, 
Isn't that ولم يكن له كفوا أحد? Isn't that ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير? This is what it means. Allah has no likeness. So this simple principle that Sayyidina Imam As-Siyuti mentions in the first subject that we should study is the key to so many things. Number one is the key to our own rational acceptance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his existence. Number two, it's a reminder that we are creation and we should know our place. Most people commit shirk because they don't know their place. They don't know their place. Like Fir'aun. فَقَالَ أَنُ رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى مَا كَنْ يَعْرِفْ حَقِيقَتَهُ وَمَا هِيَّتَهُ فَبِذَلِكَ صَارَ مُتَكَبِّرًا Fir'aun لَعْنُوا عَلَيْهِ He didn't know his place. So he thought he could achieve the attributes of Allah. أعوذ بالله But the Muslim who recognizes أَنَا مَخْلُوقَ I'm creation. And if I'm creation, that means I have a khaliq. I have a creator. So therefore, I should rely and trust and turn to that creator. This is the edifice of tawheed. So that's why we say ma'rifatul hudud, knowing this idea of temporality and accidents in creation, it will bring about zuhud, a proper responsible detachment from unhealthy things in this dunya. So Sheikh Imam, uh, Sayyidina Imam uh, 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 Ad-Dardir, he says, Huduthuhu wujuduhu ba'd al-adam, that the evidence that we are hadith temporary is that we existed when we didn't exist. Wadidduhu wahwa yusamma bil-qidam. And the opposite of huduth is, I'll define zuhid, al-awwal wal-akhir. Al-awwal wal akhir. Someone's asking me if I'm on the sunnah. Ask yourself if you're on the sunnah. Don't get this is ridiculous. You wouldn't say this in a classroom. You wouldn't stand up in a classroom and say, Are you on the sunnah? Don't say anything in the comments box. You're not willing to say to someone in person. But this is a lesson. You're being taught. Have some adab, man. Worry about yourself. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about other people. Focus on the lesson. If you don't want it, you can go. Someone asked me to define zuhid. What does zuhid mean? To mean indifferent to unhealthy attachments to the world. To not be a heathen. To not be occupied from Allah. So Sheikh Ahmad al-Dardir, he says, adam. The proof that we are temporarily, or temporary, is that we did not exist. Now we exist. Surah Al-Insan. Waksuhu, exactly. The Instagram emboldens people because, great point, they think that their wujud is stronger because they are in the comments box. They don't know their place. Waksuhu, wa huwa yusamma bil qidam. The opposite of huduth is al awal wal akhir. No beginning, no ending. What's the proof that you and I are temporary outside of just common sense? He says, Fa'lam Imam Sheikh Dardir in Al Kharida, which we teach at my school, Swiss. Sayyidina Sheikh Dardir, he says, Rahimuhullah, Thumma alaman bi anna hadha al alama. He says, You have to know that this world, a masi wallahi, he says, Thumma alaman bi anna hadha al alami, a masi wallahi al wahidi al alami. من غير شق حادث مفتقر لأنه قام به تغير الله أكبر. What does Sheikh Dardir he say that you have to know that the world is temporary. Everything except Allah is temporary, and the greatest sign of this is that you are constantly going through changes. You and I, micro and macro changes. Yeah, it's also on my YouTube page. Thank you for asking. So you can find this later on my YouTube page as well. It'll be here, inshallah, and there. But sometimes Instagram, Instagram's tripping. But thanks for asking, Barakallahu Fiki. So the first principle, Sayyidina Siyuti says, Al-Alam Hadithun. Everything is temporary. And the creator, the manufacturer of all creation is Allah, the one. Al-Qadim. Al-Qadim means the one who has no beginning. Then he does something very interesting. If you read Arabic, he doesn't say, 
what? He doesn't use well atf. After he says al wahid al qadim, he says la ibtida al wujudi. He doesn't say wala ibtida. To show you this is a sentence which is the explanation of the sentence that came before. If you're interested in studying Arabic, oftentimes the absence of a conjunction is to show a close relationship between the two sentences. What we would say is a run on sentence in Arabic is used to explain tafsir. So he says, Rahimullah wa sani'uhullahu al wahid al qadimun la tida ali wujudiha wa lantiha. He says, What does it mean that Allah is al qadim? He has no beginning and no ending. Al awal wal akhir. For example, you can see Surah al Hadid. Huwa al awal wal akhir wa zahir wa batin wa huwa bi kulli shayna. You know, subhanAllah, huwa al awal wal akhir wa zahir wa batin. This verse in Surah al Hadid, some ulama said, if you want to protect yourself from jinn and shayateen, if you feel that you're being hurt by magic or jinn or something, read this verse of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his existence is in opposition to all creation. And what are the major attributes we should know about Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala, al that Allah is alive. And that Allah wills all things, all things that are happening by the will of Allah. Nothing can happen that He didn't will, and nothing can be stopped that He will. Good and evil, pain, suffering, happiness, sadness, rich, poor, all those things are from Allah. We believe Allah knows. Allah is all powerful. And that Allah hears and sees all things. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks. And that speech is related to his existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not time to ask questions, inshallah. You can wait till after the lesson, inshallah. Again, we wouldn't stand up in a classroom and tell someone, answer my questions. We'll wait and we'll ask when we're done, alhamdulillah. I'm super excited that you want to ask a question. But be patient and, and wait till the lesson is finished. al muabbaru anhu bil Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained and expressed his attributes and his speaking and his power and his authority are all expressed in the Quran. Al maktubu fil masahif, which is written in the mushaf. Al mahfudu fi sudur, which is protected in the chests. Al muq maqru'i bil al sina, and recited by people. Qadimatun munazzahun an al jism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His sifat are, are beyond time, immortal. Al-munazzahu ala jism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a physical shape, like we have a physical shape. Walloon, or color. Walta'am, or taste. Walarad, or width. Walhulul, Allah is not contained in anything. So here is, he's explaining, right, our belief about transcendence. How do we understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah doesn't take on a human body? Tajseem, or loan, or a physical color, or ta'mi, or a taste. Anything our five senses can, can uh, experience, Allah is beyond that. And anything we can imagine, Allah is beyond that. Ma khutiru bil bari fa'arallahi al muhal. You have a great axiom that says anything you can imagine, Allah is beyond that. Ma khutiru fi aqlik. فَأَلَّهُ خِلَافٌ دارك. Anything you imagine, Allah is in opposition to that. You can't imagine, I can't imagine Allah. Because if we were to imagine him, then that would mean he's matter, because we cannot think beyond matter. If you were to close your eyes right now and try to imagine a creation that we've never seen before, a shape we've never seen before, a color we've never seen before, you couldn't do it. Try. Everyone close your eyes. Try to imagine a new creation, a new color, a new dimension, a new shape, a new angle even, and then describe it for us. You can't. And the reason you and I cannot do that is we are not creator. We are creation. So that one little exercise I just gave you is the best way to show people we're makhluqin. Subhanallah. Try it. You can't do it. So the sheikh, he says, Sayyidina Imam al-Suyuti, munazzahun ala jismu. 
Las Montana is transcendent. We don't give them a physical shape like we understand. What alone and color. That's why we shouldn't allow ourselves to be pulled into the cult of white supremacy or racism or Eurocentricism or Arabism or Daisism or Oklahomaism. All that is nonsense because all of our colors are hadith. All of our colors are temporary. And the one who created our colors is Allah. Do you know that if we use the color of our skin to hurt people, we will be potentially punished? Because this is a na'mah Allah has given us. Who will use a na'mah to be ungrateful to Allah? So the people who should be farthest away from Eurocentricism and white supremacy and any supremacy are the Muslims. Wal-Arab wal-Hulul. Allah is not, we don't describe him as a physical width or inside something. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا وَرَدَ فِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ And anything which appears in the book and the sunnah. مِنَ الْمُشْكِلِ What does he mean by mushkil? He means those verses and hadith that describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in physical form. Like the hand of Allah, the rising above the throne, all of those things like that. What are called sifat al-khabariya. Sayyidina Imam Sayyuti says, Ma wa ma warada fil kitabi wa sunnati mina mushkiri no minu bi zahirihi wa no nazihu an hakikatihi, thumma no fawidu manahu ilayhi ta'ala au no awilu. And here we see the responsibility and beauty and scholarship of Imam Sayyuti, who understands that this is a very controversial issue. So what does he do? Instead of limiting the da'ira of Ahl Sunnah, instead of saying, My group is only who's correct, he opens the way to show that actually within Sunni academic tradition. We have three methabs in aqidah, just like we have four methabs in fiqh, just like we have two methabs in language, and just like we had multiple methabs in qira'at and in tasawwuf, he recognizes that there were these three different schools of Ahl Sunnah in aqidah who engaged these kind of texts. And you all have to be very careful because there are intelligence agencies. And there are people working online to amplify and ignite the differences amongst specifically Sunnis and Muslims in general, whether Sunni or Shia, on issues that traditionally our scholars were very mature and very reflective about. Be careful of that stuff. Because watch how Imam al does it. He says, Rahimahullah, wa ma warada fil kitabi wa sunnati min al mushkiri nu'minu bi zahirihi wa nunazihuhu an haqiqatihi thumma nufawidu ilayhi subhanahu wa ta'ala aw nu'awwilu ay nu'awwil sifat al khabariya. What Imam al-Siyuti did right here is he made space for three major theological schools to fall under the purview of orthodoxy. And that's the sign of his scholarship and brilliance. Number one, he says, whenever we come across these kind of texts about Allah's hand, Allah rising above the throne, smiling, and so on and so forth, no we First, we, we understand this to be not literal. We understand it has to be transcendent. Because So none of us are going to stick to the zahir of the nas the explicit meaning of the text. Then he mentions the three different approaches that Sunni theologians had on these type of ideas and concepts. First, he says, meaning we affirm it, but we leave its true meaning to Allah while denying any human or material likeness. And this is the Athariya. This is the, the followers of Imam Ahmed of Al-Hamba. Then he says, we surrender its true meaning to Allah. Or we interpret it in a way that preserves its transcendence. So the first group, they suspend discussing it and leave the meaning to Allah to preserve Allah's transcendence. The second group, they say, no, we have to interpret it because if you're silent, someone else will start to talk about it. Silence is not a, a, a strategic weapon in the face of your enemies on things like this, because then they will begin to interpret the Qur'an and provide meanings to the Qur'an and Sunnah, which are outside of the purview of Islam. Example of this now is what it means to be a man. So Muslims, except for like Imam Dawud Walid and others, haven't talked about what it means to be a man. So now we see, unfortunately, Muslim men 
being co-opted by people on the far right who are telling him this is what it means to be a man. Because the space was empty. That's why 16 years ago, I gave a lecture in Chicago on the qualities of men in the Quran. And before that, I did a lesson on the mothers of the believers because I was worried that this gender thing was going to take off and the meaning of being a man and the meaning of being a Muslim woman were going to be defined by people outside of Islam and we would be co-opted and mentally colonized and incapable of defining who we are because the dominant culture is defining it for us. That's why some scholars, like the Asha'ira, they said, no, we have to make ta'wil because if you're silent on what these attributes are, that leaves a space open for disbelievers to start to tell Muslims what their text means. See something there. And also, this is the way of Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. So he said, Rahimahullah, awilu. So here, Imam Asiyuti, in approaching these texts, which are sometimes complicated and difficult to understand, which if we were to interpret them explicitly would imply that God is a human, a'udhu billah. He said there are two approaches to this. Number one is to affirm it's, it's the text and leave the meaning to Allah. This is the school of Imam Ahmed wa Hamba. And to deny any human likeness. The second schools, which are the majority of Sunnis throughout history, the Maturidis and the Ash'aris, it's a historical fact. I'm not going to get into arguments with people. That's ridiculous. We don't have time for that. They say we have to affirm that Allah is transcendent, but then we're going to interpret these words in ways that affirm that transcendence. If you think about it, both schools, they take two different ways. One may take a plane. One may take a train. But the destination is the same. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah's transcendence is preserved. So the Salafis and the Sufis, you guys are fighting over the road, but you all end up at the same, de the same destination. You end up at the same destination. And so therefore we, as educators and the public, we should ask ourselves, where did what did these divisions lead to? Where have they brought any khair to the ummah? And if you're Sunni, I'm going to say something that's somewhat controversial. Can you show me one Sunni state that defends Sunnis like Iran defend Shias? Politically and militarily. We are slaughtered across the globe. We are decimated everywhere. And nobody comes to our aid except Allah. Because we're too busy fighting over these little issues to take on the major issues like making sure that we as a community defend one another and support one another. So this division that you find amongst Muslims on TikTok and Instagram on theology, run from it. Don't waste your time. Then he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and we're going to finish now. He says, Meaning we have to believe in Qadr, what Allah has decreed, the good and the evil. Whatever he decreed will happen, what he did not decree won't happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive shirk. What does it mean though, if somebody didn't repent? Allah has promised that he will not forgive them. So in Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika li man yasha doesn't mean this verse Allah forgives all sins except shirk doesn't mean Allah won't forgive shirk it means if someone doesn't repent to Allah before they die we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil afiyah wa la yajibu alayhi shay and no one can obligate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do anything Then he says, Rahimahullah, I'm going to put out a schedule for the lives, inshallah, Ayman. Thank you for asking. This is my fault. Forgive me, everybody. It's been a, a crazy uh, time. Then he says, Arsala rusulahu bil mu'jizat al bahirat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. No problem. You can send me a DM also, bro. If you need to go, send me the DM and I'll respond to you, inshallah. It seems like you have a serious question. I'm here to help you, alhamdulillah, and to be at your service. I'm honored that you would want to ask me a question. You can either send it here in the Q&A box or you can DM it to me and I'll take care of you. 
Then he says, continuing in his discussion of Usul al-Din as we finish, Allah sent prophets with clear exam, uh, miracles. The word ma'jizat is from ajaz. Ajaz means to be weak. We see ajuz is an old woman. She's too weak. Ajaz to anil amr means I'm too weak to do something. So al-mu'jizat are those things which are beyond physical law. Those things which are beyond human strength. That's why they're a miracle. So he says, Allah sent the prophets with miracles. وَخَطَمَ بِهِمْ مُحَمَّدًا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ And the last prophet, the seal of the prophets is Sayyidina Muhammad. عَلَيْهِ سَلَةُ السَّلَامُ وَعَلَيْكُمْ السَّلَامُ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهُ وَالْمُعْجِزَاتِ And then he defines, what are mu'jizat? He says, أَمْرٌ خَارِقٌ لِلْعَادَةِ Mu'jizat are those things that go beyond norms, physical norms. That's a miracle. We can take a lesson from that. Maybe sometimes you want to post something on Instagram or YouTube or TikTok and you want to add a little flavor to it. You want to do something halal that will bring attention and then shaitan comes to you and says, stop for Allah, you're doing this to show off. Why would you do this? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send the prophets with mu'jizat? Obviously to gain the attention of people. So when you want to gain the attention of people but through something good and not the goal isn't attention. The goal is to guide them to something better. It's acceptable. We need to be balanced. So he says, Rahimahullah, wal mu'jizatun amrun khariqun il adati ala wafqi tahaddi. That the purpose of that the purpose of these mu'jizat were to argue. Were to argue. And that the Prophets alayhim salatu salam, they were sent uh, with these mu'jizat. Alhamdulillah, as a means to establish themselves as prophets and anbiya. وَيُكُونُ كَرَامَةٍ لِلْوَلِي And those kind of things that happen are gifts to the awliya, the friends of Allah. Who are the friends of Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is the friend of those who believe. Anyone who says, La ilaha illallah is from the awliya of Allah. And then the levels of being a friend to Allah are only known to Allah. Who a'lamu biman ittaqa. Illa nahwa waladin duna wa. Then he says, وَنَعْتَقِلُ أَنَّ عَذَابَ الْقَبْرِ حَقٌ And we believe that the punishment of the grave is true. Allah says in the Quran, سَنُعَذِّبُهُمْ مَرَّتَيْنِ ثُمَّ يُرُدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Allah says, we will punish them twice and then they will return to Allah. How are they going to be punished twice? The people of Fir'aun. Number one, the adab of being drowned in the ocean. The second punishment is in the grave. The third punishment is when they go to meet Allah. So we find in the, the Quran, in the context of Fir'aun and his people, three punishments. We're going to punish them twice. And then they will, we will send them back for a grievous punishment. So the first two punishments, drowning, grave, the last punishment is in the hereafter, Al-Akhirah. وَسُؤَالُ الْمَلَكَيْنِ حَقٍ And we believe that the questions of the angels in the grave, who is your deen, who is your lord, what's your deen, who is your messenger, alayhi salam, is true. وَالْحَشْرُ وَالْحَشْرَ وَالْمَعَادِ حَقٍ And we believe that people will be gathered together and, and on the plane where they will be questioned before they get questioned. This is the truth. وَالْحَوْدُ حَقٍ And the fountain of the Prophet is true. وَالْسِرَاتُ حَقٍ And the bridge that people cross over hell is truth. And that the scales are true, where people's deeds will be weighed. The intercession of the Prophet, the six intercessions of the Prophet are true. And that some believers will see Allah in the hereafter. And that the mi'raj physically happening with the Prophet was the truth. وَنُزُولَ عِيسَىٰ قُرَبَ السَّاعَةِ حَقٍ And the return of Isa near the end of times is true. وَقَتَلَهُ الدَّجَّالَ حَقٍ And him killing the Dajjal is true. وَرَفَعَ الْقُرْآنَ حَقٍ And that the Qur'an will be removed from the face of the earth towards the end of time is true. So Imam Suti now is going through the details of Usul al-Din. He's not going to give you the, 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 the description of each one because we said the purpose of this text is to cover the 14 sciences that you need to conceptualize in order to move. Oh, I need to study this more. Oh, I need to study this more. Oh, I need to push into this more. Oh, I need to learn this more. 
and that heaven and hell are true. And that they are now, they exist now. They were created, they exist. And that paradise is in the universe. And we don't say anything about, no one knows where hell is. And here we see something beautiful. Someone as great as Imam as in knowledge. Someone as brilliant and as intelligent and as accomplished as he is says, you know what? I'm not going to talk about that. What's called a tawakuf Bab at tawakuf Bab at tawakuf Alhamdulillah. Hari madama khayra bi'idnillah. So he says, wa'ani nar tawakuf Aw naqif. We're not going to talk about it. We don't know. Now, if we go online, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, wherever, all these different people talk about everything they don't know. They even now talk about people they don't know. For subhanAllah, look at Imam Asiyuti, all the knowledge he memorized more than one million hadith. And here he says in front of you and I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I want you all to listen to this part. This is from our doctrine as Muslims. And compare this to how people treat each other nowadays. And he says, and that is that sin does not take someone out of Iman. We don't. People make mistakes. They fall into sin. We don't throw them out of the community. We don't tell them they're no longer Muslims. We're not khawarij. We're not ahlu bid'ah. We believe in repentance. We believe in a redemption. So he says, وَأَنَّ الْفِسْقَ لَا يُزِيلُ الإيمان أي نؤمن بأن الفسق أو نعتقد بأن الفسق لا يزيل الإيمان. We believe that sins doesn't take a person out of Islam. Now, how do we treat people? Subhanallah. We may see, and I've never understood how someone has time to notice other people, how they have that that budget to pay attention to people so much that they forget themselves. The Prophet ﷺ said the successful one is the one who's so busy with his or her need to grow, they don't notice other people. And you don't know where people are coming from. Like sometimes I've done lives and people, that it'll be like their first time. And they might, they, they might not have a name that's suitable. Their, their, their profile pic may not be that good. And people will start to pound them. And one time a person contacted me in DM and said, you know, I've been away from Islam for so long. And I came into your life and people were so nice to me and so considerate. I fell in love with Islam again, subhanAllah. And I've seen people who are so abused and, and mistreated by fellow Muslims that it pushes them away from Islam. Be a physician, not an executor, man. Be a physician, not an executor. And Sayyidina Suti says, وَأَنَّ الْفِسْقَ لَا يَزِيلُ الْإِيمَانِ that sin doesn't take someone out of Islam. Wala al bid'ah. He says, and also bid'ah. It's very rare that we say a bid'ah takes someone out of Islam, except in certain issues that we'll talk about in the future. Illa al tadseem. He says, the only type of bid'ah that takes someone out of Islam is to say that Allah has a human shape, like the Christians. Or as the Jews say, God wrestled with. Somebody and lost in, in their text. For us, that takes someone out of Islam. Wa inkara ilmillahi al or to deny part of to say, for example, Allah knows great things; He doesn't know small things, as the Mu'tazilites say. As the Mu'tazilites say, it's a problem. We believe Allah knows all things. Listen to this is this is our belief as Sunnis, Orthodox Sunnism. So people ask, do we make takfir of Shia? Of course not. Did you hear what he just said? Did you hear what he just said? And these issues where we have to acknowledge our differences, definitely we have differences with, with Shia thought and fiqh, but not to the point that we can't allow ourselves to work on major issues. Look at the Muslim world. Look at the Muslim community. Look at the disarray, the slaughter of Muslims, our lack of economic utility, 
our resources have been stolen from us. Our land has been stolen from us. Our leadership has been stolen from us. And you and I are going to argue over secondary issues. Wallahi al last week, I was talking to a beautiful brother who fought in the Bosnian War in the 90s. And his job was to sing songs to the soldiers on the battlefield to motivate them to fight the Serbs when the entire world turned its back on Bosnians and Albanians and people in, in, in Macedonia. You know what he told me? Later on, he kept going and he would sing Nasheed, Sarawat upon the Prophet to the to soldiers in Bosnia to strengthen them, to embolden them, to fight against the Serbs. Listen to this, what he told me. He said, but towards the end, when I would go out to sing songs, there were a group of people who were new. They weren't from the, the locals. And they started telling me, this is bid'ah, this is haram, this is fisk, this is evil, this is not allowed. I said to him, subhanAllah, they had time on the battlefield while you're fighting the Serbs to argue about the validity of music? Where do you think those people are that argued with him? What do you think happened to them? They died. They got killed. So the moment, the lack of priorities, a lack of priorities is the sign of colonality. Like if you want to be really honest, you want to talk about decolonality? If you want to decolonize yourself, learn Arabic. If you want to decolonize yourself, learn Arabic, learn Urdu, learn Persian, learn Wolof. The second sign of colonality is you argue over what the Kafir tells you you should argue. So you and I are now arguing over issues that aren't even important to us. Look how Muslims in America are caught up in the cultural wars of America that have nothing to do with this except a few things like immorality, sexual morality, homosexuality, all that, of course, is forbidden. But how we've allowed that to now suddenly supplement all of our concerns. So we have no agenda except the agenda of what Tucker Carlson tucks us at tonight with or what AOC tells us is important. Where's the Muslim agenda? Where's the Muslim agenda on issues? So that's the sign of colonality is a lack of priority. So Sayyidina Imam al-Suyuti says, وَأَنَّ الْفِسْقَ لَا يَزِيلُ الْإِيمَانَ وَلَا الْبِدْعَةِ إِلَّا أَجْسَدْسِيمَ إِنْكَارِ عِلْمِ اللَّهِ الْجُزْئِيَةِ Sayyidina Suyuti says here in the Nuqaya that Sin does not take someone out of Islam, nor does bid'ah accept certain types of bid'ah. And then listen to what he says, brothers and sisters. He, he says, Rahimahullah. <laughs> we do not definitively claim that someone is going to be permanently punished in hell. And Fatima, I want to welcome you to this space. Ahlan wa sahlan. I appreciate you being here and pushing in. And he says, and we do not definitively affirm for anyone that they will be in hell permanently from the believing Muslim community if they didn't repent. That's not my business. Now you see people, man, the person's going to hell. This person, Allah will punish them. Allah will never forgive them. Who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? Allah says, Allah can punish who he wants. He can reward who he wants. He can punish who he wants. He can forgive who he wants. This is our aqidah, aqidah, which is balanced, caring, mature, flexible, nuanced, responsible. Not just going around declaring everyone out of Islam and everyone's deviant and everyone's dead. Well, those kind of people actually are just projecting their selfishness on the community. It's very easy to be an immature isolationist. It's very difficult to be a mature part of an ummah. Because the word ummah is the outcome of maturity. The word ummah is the outcome of nuance. The word ummah is the product of a deliberate process, not an isolationist. It's very important. Now think about this, brothers and sisters. Think about what I'm about to tell you. And this is why those people hate me. People online, people showing up in the comments box. It doesn't bother me. I've been at this for too long. And I know who I am, alhamdulillah. And I have my teachers to correct me. But I don't like it when they bully you guys. That's what bothers me. I don't like that stuff, man. Because why are you being a bully? Let pe people grow in their faith, man. Leave people alone. Worry about yourself. Go mow your yard, man. Go mow your yard. Great hashtag. Go mow your yard, bro. Go sweep. 
the sidewalk. Go bring groceries to your neighbor. Don't come and bully the Muslims. And people are so brave and so strong that the total object of their anger and angst are Muslim sisters. Like, wow. Like, really? Now you're some kind of brazen superhero. You're the Jon Snow of the Ummah slaying dragons, bro. Because you're able to take all of your emasculized insecurities and project your inability to be mature with men and women and blame Muslim women for your problems. Is that not being co-opted by people? Is that not now being sort of used in a proxy war through some kind of post-colonial binge hangover? Because historically, when the colonialists entered into the Muslim world, read the history of Algeria, who's the first person they attacked was our mothers. Who was the first person they attacked was our sisters. Who's the first? They went after the Muslim woman, largely through hijab and niqab. So now you have to wonder, who are you being used by if in the name of religiosity, you are attacking Muslim women who are good sisters? You are now an extension of this man. And also on the other end, extreme feminism, which constantly attacks Muslim men as being the whole problem. Both of these are games, man. Both of these are games. The left wants to eat your soul. The right wants to eat your body. Just remember that. Conservatives, they want to eat our body. Liberals want to eat our hearts and minds. So then who can you truly rely on? إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمْ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Your only wali is Allah, his messenger. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And your fellow believers. But if you and I are so busy attacking each other and destroying each other, when we come out of this battle with the left and the right, you and I will no longer have a relationship anymore. So then we have nothing left. Watch out, man. The people are playing chess, not checkers. So he says, We do not say that someone's going to hell who hasn't repented. We leave it to Allah from the believers. Nor do we say they're going to stay in hell forever. This is our aqidah, this mature, responsible aqidah, which preserves dogma, but brings the beauty of humanity to it. Then he says, And the best of creation is Sayyidina Muhammad. We know Rabbi Al-Awwal is coming. The birth and death of the Prophet happened in this month. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we say, Allahumma salli wa sallam alayhi fil awwali wa fil akhiri wa fil mala il a'la ya rabbil alameen. Habibullahi al-Mustafa, the beloved of Allah, Sayyidina Muhammad. Fakhaliluhu Ibrahim, then Ibrahim. Fa Musa wa Isa wa Nuh. So first we say Sayyidina Muhammad alayhi salam then Ibrahim, then Musa, then Isa, then Nuh. And these are Ulul Azam. These are Ulul Azam in Rusul. Fal Malaika. And then after those, we say the Malaika, our best. Wa afdaluhum Jibreel. And the best angels, Jibreel. Fa Abu Bakr, fa Umaru, fa Uthmanu, fa Ariyun. And then Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali. Karam Allah wajha. Although there is a khilaf even among Sunnis on this issue. فباقية العشرة and then after that the ten promised paradise فأهل بدر فأحد فالبيعة بالحديبية فسائر الصحابة and then after the ten promised paradise the people of Badr the people of Uhud the people of بيعة الحديبية and then the rest of the Sahaba فباق and then the rest of the Ummah of the Prophet اختلاف أوصافهم based on our تقوى and our إيمان then he finishes the section on أصول الدين we finished it now الحمد لله he says, And of course, amongst Ahl Sunnah, there's a difference of opinion. Some Sunnis, they say the best woman is Fatima, just like Al Imamiya Ja'fariya. Some Sunnis say the best woman is Sayyidah Maryam. Salam. And some Sunnis say the best woman is Sayyidah Khadija. Whatever. None of this is going to lead to Amal. But just re realize this is Ishtihadat. These are issues of uh, theological sort of opinions. We shouldn't. Uh, uh, wreck ourselves over this. And then the Umahat al Mu'minin. Khadija, in his opinion, Khadija is superior to Sayyidah Aisha. Khadija to Aisha to. 
Of course, many scholars, they don't like to talk about this stuff because they said it leads to greater differences that do not lead to actions or unity. What we should do is just acknowledge this school says this, this school says this is my opinion, your opinion, khalas. Then he says, that the prophets are free from the sins that will compromise their role as prophets. And that the prophets are just and honest and they have integrity. The, the Sahaba, excuse me, the Sahaba, Radwanallah Ali. وَأَنَّ الشَّافِعِيَّ and Imam الشَّافِعِي وَمَارِكَ وَأَبَا حَنِيفَ وَأَحْمَدْ وَسَائِرَ الْأَئِمَّةِ عَلَى هُدَى And that those Imams, those early Imams, what they left is guidance, alhamdulillah. But not the same guidance as Qur'an, but guidance in the area of human endeavorment. Remember this. وَأَنَّ الْإِمَامْ أَبَا الْحَسْنَ الْأَشْعَرِي إِمَامُ فِي سُنَّةِ مُقَدَّمْتِ هذا فيه كلام يعني. Then he says when it comes to the issues of Aqeelah, Imam Abu Hassan, wa ana Ash'ari. Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari muqaddam. La, hada fi kalam. Yani Imam Ahmed in the Hanabila muqaddam. Wa Imam Abu Mansur al Maturidi muqaddam. So it depends on which school you're reflecting from. And Imam al Siyuti, of course, he's Ash'ari. So he's going to say Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari muqaddam. Lakin naqulu kulun ala khair. All those Imams are good, alhamdulillah. And all those Imams were right and sometimes they were wrong because they're human beings. And depending on your perspective, you will say which one you prefer. If you're Hanbali, you're going to say Imam Ahmed. If you're Ash'ari, you're going to say Imam Abu Hassan. If you are a Maturidi, you're going to say Imam Maturidi, Abu Mansur. All three of these are Imams of the three madhabs of Aqidah and Ahl Sunnah. Imam Safarini, Rahimahullah, he said, Ahl Sunnah The Imams of Sunni theology are three Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and he's the Imam of the Athariyah. Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari is the Imam of Ash'ira. Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturi is the Imam of Maturidiyah. So what? You and I are fighting about these Imams, but we don't even protect the Imam in our masjid. You and I are going to fight about the validity of these Imams, and we forgot, like our brother here from Measure Tones who teaches Quran, to give that Imam attention. We, we use the past as an excuse, not, subhanAllah, to... to uh, uh, um, to negotiate the future. But we use the past to stop us from moving forward. And of course, he doesn't mean that these are the only Imams, but he's doing this just as an example. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, for example, Imam Zaid, for the Zaidiyah, كُلٌ عَلَىٰ خَيْرٍ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ تَرِيقَ الْجُنَيْدُ وَصَحْبِهِ تَرِيقٌ مُقَوَّمٌ And now he mentions a tariq al sufiya which comes from Imam Junaid, Al-Baghdari, which of course is Muqawwam because Imam Junaid was an alim in fiqh and Quran and hadith and so many things. That's why his tariq is a safe tariq, alhamdulillah. So congratulations, mashallah, you finished the first science of the 14 sciences. We should know. Imam Asiyuti is now mapping out this path for us. If we really want to study, this class is not for people who want to argue, people who want to debate, yalla. You can go, there's a thousand places. You can even do that like on on a fortnight or whatever somewhere. This is not the place for that. This is the place for people who want to grow. People want to think critically. Of course, people can ask questions. Absolutely, for sure. But the arguments, I'm too old for that. You want to argue about those simple things, continue to waste your time. And I gave you the example earlier of the brother in the Bosnian war who's singing the sheets and these guys come and tell him who are not from Bosnia that what you're doing is bidah and haram and those guys got killed. That brother, he's still alive. He's still alive. So next week, inshallah, hopefully, we'll do ulum, the next science, ilm tafsir the science of tafsir. And we'll go through all of them until we finish all 14. If you have any questions, we can take your questions now in the comment box. box fikum. If not, this will be saved on my YouTube page. You can find it there, probably better. The recording will be a little better, alhamdulillah. Uh, and people asking if you want to support, alhamdulillah, this work. Please go to my website, join. Someone can type it in the comments box for me. Join.suhaybweb.com. Support our school, man. Support this kind of education. This is the kind of education you like, you should support it. This is the kind of education you enjoy, you should support it. Don't just say, mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. La. Man ansari ilallah. Who will help us? So you can visit join.suhaybweb.com. You can take classes with me and other scholars, alhamdulillah, teachers. Someone's asking, is the gelatin in the vitamins haram? It, no, because as Sheikh Yasser Qadi, who's head of our Fiqh Council, North American Fiqh Council, notes in his YouTube video on this, that the molecular structure of the gelatin has been changed. 
But if the molecular structure of the gelatin has been changed, we have a great axiom that says rulings go according to their causes. The cause is gone, the ruling's gone, so now it's permissible. I have a question about discussing Islam with Sikhs, explaining our beloved Prophet to them is the seal of the Prophet as they believe Guru Nanak has come after. Please, could you explain how to address it? Yeah, it's mentioned in the Quran, Khatam al Anbiya wa Mursaleen. The Prophet said, La Nabiya Badi. This is doctrine, Yani. The Prophet said, There's no Prophet after me, only liars. You don't want to say that to them, maybe it will offend them. But then you can talk about why the finality is, of prophethood is important and how, even within the Sikh community, and I have a great relationship with Sikh people, that they don't have the history of law, theology, tasqiyat, and that you find within Islamic framework that a prophet would bring. Yes, yeah, so I already answered the question about gelatin. Alhamdulillah, maybe you missed it. Mada, mada. Someone's asking, what is your opinion about someone who says all the Ash'aris are kuffar? Yani, hal you kafir Imam Asyuti? Hal you kafir Imam Qurtubi? Hal you kafir Imam Ibn Kathir? Hal you kafir? So if we say that the Ash'ira are kuffar, that means that anyone that's Ash'ari is kafir. It's not allowed to take fatwa, tafsir, hadith, anything from kafirs. So then that would mean 90% of the academic tradition of Islam is gone because someone has declared all those people kuffar. But at the same time, don't waste your time with this kind of thing. What a that when someone says something like that, just say, okay, bye. Ma salama. I don't have time. And what you realize is when you don't want to argue with them, actually, they just wanted to argue for the sake of argument. Who wants to say something like that? When will you come to Kuala Lumpur? Uh, yeah, inshallah, one day I hope to visit uh, Kuala Lumpur bi idnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala na pagi. Alhamdulillah, one day, inshallah ta'ala na pagi. Uh, Kuala Lumpur, Bole Bole, inshallah. Uh, any other questions that people have? Uh, my four year old asked me about how big Allah is or where, etc. So you have to realize, mashallah, I have a four year old too. So they're not able to moralize or to logically engage things the way we do. So you just say, Allah is bigger than everything, Allah is beyond everything. You don't need to get into theological debates with kids, man. They're, they're small, alhamdulillah. Just remind them that Allah loves you, Allah is close to you, Allah is with you. Khalas, let them, you know, let them find Allah's love in the early stages of their lives. So that love, that's why hab and hub, it means a seed, will grow. And they will have that relationship with Allah. Take a few, few more questions and then I have to jump off. Thank you so much, Fatima. We really enjoyed Batul Kaman, mashallah, uh, you being here. Uh, yeah, I also missed someone said about New York City. I miss New York. Inshallah, hope to visit soon, inshallah. I will try to put out a schedule for this class. My apologies. Uh, next week I have to teach. We're starting our youth programs at this time, so I'll be teaching young people uh, at Swiss. Again, you can join at join.swayabub.com. May Allah SWT bless you, increase you. Please share this with others if you want to help. Also share if you found the class beneficial for other people and tag us. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.